All right, three weeks down of spring camp, just two weeks left to go. Nine practices in the books. Pitt has three practices this week, three practices next week, the third of which is the spring game at Akershore Stadium on April 13th. So with basically like 60% of spring camp over, I thought we could take a look back at what we've learned over these first three full weeks of spring camp, these first nine practices for a scrimmage or two, and kind of what the biggest storylines have been coming out of spring camp. Whether it's the quarterbacks we're talking about, the offense as a whole, some of the defensive players, youth movement, lots of the things we've been talking about already. Let's sum them up, sum them up all today as we go over the big spring storylines. Get your week started here on the Morning Pit on youtube.com slash pentalaircom. Yeah, it's Monday at the start of a brand new week here on youtube.com slash pentalaircom. I'm Chris Peak from pentalair.com. Glad to be with you as always. Hope you had a good weekend, good holiday weekend. It was safe and happy. The weather was beautiful. I don't know what it's going to be like this week, but the weekend was really nice yesterday in particular. Uh, so I hope you had a good one. And I'm glad we could get our week started here on youtube.com slash pantheleracom. You know the deal. What we always ask you to do is like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantheleracom. And that way you don't miss any of our pit video content. We have stuff every day. We have these morning pit videos every day of the week, Monday through Friday. We have our weekly live show that we do every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Me and Jim Hammett get together for a little bit of pit sports talk with you. We have... Post game shows that we do when there are games. There aren't any games right now, so we don't have any of those. But we also have, you know, interviews and press conferences and practice highlights and all kinds of things. Lots of pit video content for you to check out right here at youtube.com slash pantheleracom. And the way to make sure that you never miss any of it is to subscribe to our YouTube channel. The button's right down there. You see the yellow dot com. It's right on top of it. Yep, right down there on top of that yellow dot com is a little blue subscribe button. So click that thing. And you'll be subscribed to our YouTube channel. We're getting close to 4,000. I would really love to get that number sometime soon. So maybe you can help us out. We didn't get there by the end of March. Maybe we'll get there by the end of April. It'd be cool if we got there by the end of this week. Do your part. Click the subscribe. And then while you're at it, like this video as well. And, of course, the website, we always talk about it right here, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of Pitt Sports News on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. You find it all at pantheloir.com and message boards to interact with hundreds and thousands of other pit fans. All day, every day, pit fans are hanging out on the message boards at panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com to get all of the pit sports news. They get all the coverage at pantheloir.com and then they talk about it with other pit fans in the best online community of pit sports fans that you're going to find. So go check out the website pantherlair.com. And then, of course, like and subscribe our videos right here on YouTube.com slash Pantheleracom. Lots of pit stuff for you. All right, uh, nine practices down, six left to go. Like I say, that sixth practice is the spring game on April 13th. So five more practices, I would say, in the south side. I mean, I know they have two practices this week in the south side. I'm not sure where they're going to be on Saturday. I think they're planning to have another scrimmage. I would assume they'll go to Akershore Stadium for that. We'll see what the plan ends up being. Um and then they'll have two practices next week and then the spring game on Saturday, April 13th. And so, you know, I, I was thinking back over what we've learned or what the biggest storylines. I, I shouldn't say what we've learned because it's always a question of how much you learn at all in spring camp. You know, what do you really learn about the team in spring camp? What do the players and coaches really learn about the team in spring camp? There have been plenty of times when uh, a pit team has come out of spring camp thinking one thing about itself. Uh, only to find out something different and you know it even you know you talk to the coaches or the players they, uh, we, they think this or they think that and then you get to the season and find out it's something pretty different from what they thought it was going to be and certainly we all come up with our own ideas of who the team is coming out of spring camp and then some of those things come to fruition and some of them very much do not but I think after three weeks, after nine practices, there are a few things that have emerged as interesting storylines. And they may not necessarily be things we've learned, may not necessarily be things that we would say, oh, we know this about the team. Um, but they are storylines nonetheless and, and interesting storylines that have emerged. And, you know, probably the first one, and it's, it's a prominent storyline for every football team and every practice and every situation, it's the quarterback situation. And whether you have a wide open job or you have a you know three year starter coming back, it's always an interesting topic to discuss, and it's certainly been one of the primary storylines for Pitt this spring. 
we've written a lot about it. We've talked a lot about it. If you, you know, I talk about the spring camp videos here on youtube.com slash pantheletic.com. A whole bunch of them are quarterbacks throwing passes to wide receivers and tight ends and running backs. The quarterbacks are prominently featured in our videos here at youtube.com slash pantheletic.com. So yeah, it's one of the big storylines. And and the first thing I would say when people ask like, well, how the quarterback's doing, I would tell you that it seems like Nate Yarnell is doing pretty well. You know, and, and I think you kind of go individually through the five scholarship quarterbacks when you talk about the storylines. And I think the number one is that Nate Yarnell came out of last season as the starting quarterback. He started the final two games, finally moved into that starting role and held on to that for the final two games. And then he entered spring camp um, as the number one and seemingly has nothing done nothing to lose that job uh, over the first nine practices. In fact, I mean, we talked to Cade Bell last week. That video is right here at youtube.com slash pantheletic.com. We talked to Cade Bell, and it, it was it was pretty clear from him that he's happy with what he's gotten out of Nate Yarnell so far, how Nate Yarnell has run the offense, how he's led the offense, how he's learned the offense. And we'll talk about that process of learning the new offense in a second because that's obviously a primary storyline as well. Uh, but Cade Bell seemed pretty impressed with Nate Yarnell and how he's done so far as Pitt's number one quarterback. Um, prior to spring camp, like somebody asked maybe during the mailbag or something like that, like, what's your best guess on who's going to be the starting quarterback this season? And, you know, Yarnell was my my guess. And, and Yarnell continues to be the favorite in the clubhouse. Um, you know, those odds may have gone up or gone down, but you know, ultimately, uh, you know, Yarnell has been the favorite and continues to be the favorite and will continue to be the favorite until something drastic happens otherwise. Now, I think other guys will compete with him. I think there's a, there is some competition going on there a little bit, uh, but I don't see Nate Yarnell losing a significant chunk of first team reps, and I honestly don't see him losing the job. I think this is going to be Nate Yarnell's job in 2024. And then we'll see where they're at in 2025. And obviously, if Yarnell struggles or something in 2024, then there, you know, then then there could be a change. Um, you'd like to think the change would happen quicker than it did last year, but I think it's Nate Yarnell's job to lose. And and I don't want to say it just in the way of, well, Nate Yarnell has done nothing to lose the job, so he's still the starter. I I don't want to say it like that because I feel like that sort of diminishes whatever he's done and, and minimizes his accomplishments or how he's played. I think he's been pretty good this spring from everything I've heard. He's been pretty solid this spring and, you know, and, and good and, and done a decent job running the offense. And there is a learning curve. There are growing pains with this new offense because of how different it is from what they did before. But with that understood, Yarnell has done well um, operating the offense. You know, and, and, and I think sometimes I get the impression sometimes that where they've run into struggles, it's not necessarily Nate Yarnell. It's it's because the other guys don't know the offense as well as he does. That And I don't mean the other quarterbacks. I mean the other positions. You know, the, the wide receivers, running backs, tight ends, O-line maybe don't have as strong a grasp on the offense as the quarterbacks do, which is probably to be expected to a certain extent. The quarterbacks have that responsibility to be able to run – you know, I mean, they need to know it all. They need to be really good at it. And it seems like Yarnell has done so um, through nine practices. You know, obviously understanding that there's a long way to go and a lot of time for him to improve. I can't say I'm too surprised about that. What is interesting is what's happening behind Yarnell, where it appears that Eli Holstein, the transfer from Alabama, has made quite a move. Uh, Holstein enrolled in January after spending his freshman season at Alabama, where he redshirted, spent most of his time on the scout team. Um, by some accounts, from what we've heard, played well on the scout team at Alabama, but it's scout team work, even if you're going against a, a, a defense full of NFL draft picks. But Holstein came in, and, and I wasn't really sure how he would fit into the rotation. I thought it would be Yarnell number one, Christian Bayer number two, and then we'll see where Ty Diefenbach, who's you know coming off a red shirt freshman se- a, a, a true freshman season where he redshirted just like Holstein, uh, you know, and then Julian Duggar, who enrolled early as a true freshman. 
I wasn't really sure how those guys were going to stack up. I, I thought Holstein would eventually emerge as the top of that group, but I wasn't sure if he would push himself into the top two. But it seems like that has happened. After three weeks of spring camp, it seems like Holstein is either pushing Vare for the number two job or has passed Vare for the number two job. Uh, again, when we talked to Cade Bell last week, it was pretty stark. There was a pretty stark contrast in the way he talked about Christian Vare and the way he talked about Eli Holstein. And I think that, you know, and I, and I talked about this last week on the morning pit, I, you know, and on the live show and on the message boards. I mean, I've talked about this a few times. Uh, it, it seems like Holstein has made a real push uh, in the last, you know, in these three weeks of spring camp, so much so that he may be the number two right now. And the quarterback who's providing the primary competition for Nate Arnell, which is remarkable. I mean, when you talk about a storyline, that's one of the prominent storylines this spring is how Holstein has come along and potentially put himself in position to push Yarnell probably to work as his number two this season and then really make a go of, of the starting job at the starting job next year. So that's a big storyline. Um, kind of along with that is the storyline of Pitt's offense this spring and, and sort of the development and the growth and the, the progress of learning a brand new offense. And, and you pretty much go off of what you're hearing from players and coaches, either on the record or off the record. Uh, I think there are bumps in the road. You know, it, it certainly seems like there are growing pains and a learning curve and some challenges in trying to get this new offense learned by everybody to be able to run it fast. And that's certainly what we've heard the most is the tempo, the speed, going fast, snapping the ball quickly, but getting into a rhythm while you're doing it. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of aspects of this offense that have sort of come out over the past few weeks. The number one aspect or element is, is that tempo, is going fast. Uh, but being able to operate at that speed is not the same thing as wanting to operate at that speed. And in its current state, I'm not in development, I'm not sure that Pitt's offense is really ready to run at that speed. Now, they're going to keep doing it because they need to get used to doing it and they're, they they have to be comfortable doing it. Uh, but along the way, they need to learn the offense and master the offense so they can actually do it. Uh, Pitt, you know, the offense lost the scrimmage two weeks ago because they committed a bunch of turnovers. Could that be because they were going a little too fast and getting sloppy? I mean, seems like a reasonable guess to me. Um, but I think this is probably to be expected, that it's going to take some time to really iron out some of these wrinkles and and master going at this tempo. Uh, my guess, if you see it in the spring game, it's going to be really watered down. They might go tempo. I mean, because there's no secrets about that. Everybody knows they want to go fast. Um, I don't think you'll see, I mean, you certainly won't see the full offense, but I think you'll see them use tempo in the spring game and, and try to get into something of a rhythm with a very watered down basic playbook. And, you know, hopefully for their sake and for yours, as someone who's watching it, they're able to get a bit of rhythm going with, with some, you know, very basic stuff. Uh, and if not, it's going to be ugly and, and the defense is going to win. Uh, but that's one of the big storylines is how this thing has been progressing. And and I don't think anyone would say it's a finished product. And I don't think anyone would say that they're, they're feeling great about where they are other than to say that they keep building. And, you know, I think coaches are able to take sort of a long view of it. Of It may not look very good right now, but because they're still building, they, they feel good about it because they keep growing and progressing. Um, but I think this offense has another – four months until the season starts and they're going to need every bit of it, you know, five months really. And I think they're going to need as much time as they can get. Um, because it takes, it takes time to adjust to something brand new like this, uh, which is a, a big departure from where they were a year ago. Uh, over on the other side of the ball, um, you know, I think one of the biggest storylines and some of the guys we've heard about the most are the young safeties. And it's pretty interesting because the safety position is one where, you know, you have veteran leaders back, veteran starters, guys who were really good for Pitt last year, the leading tackler, and I think the third leading tackler or something like that uh, in the two safeties, Donovan McMillan and, and Javon McIntyre. And I think 
those were two of the sort of sure things on this team and certainly on this defense heading into this 2024 season. But what's happened, and then, you know, PJ O'Brien behind them is another veteran who played a ton of snaps last year. You had this three man rotation pretty much set. But what's happened is a few guys have emerged in that at, at that safety position where all of a sudden you're looking at you're like, wow, they might have like five guys that they could play because you've got those three McMillan and McIntyre and O'Brien. But what has really happened this spring and what's been one of the most prominent storylines this spring is the the dual emergences of Cruz Brookins and Jesse Anderson. Two guys who were in the 2023 recruiting class, two guys who redshirted last year, um, saw just a handful of snaps, just some very brief playing time, not enough to burn a redshirt. But they've been two of the more talked about players on either side of the ball this spring and not just getting talked up because the coaches need somebody to talk about, but again, you talked up because they're making plays. They're making an impact. They're impressing the coaches. They're opening eyes and they're looking like they're going to make it, uh, make an impact this season. And I'm not really sure how they would fit in. I'm like, I'm not sure how you're going to find all the snaps because you don't want to take McMillan off the field very much. You don't want to take McIntyre off the field very much. Uh, O'Brien is right there for any time you want to take one of those two guys off the field. And now you've got Anderson and Brookins, these really promising young players who are making plays in spring camp. And you're saying like, how are, uh, now where are you going to get those guys on the field? And Pat Narduzzi said one of them could play as like the nickelback in the third down package, the passing package, that Delta defensive package. And then you could do that, but even that's like 15 snaps per game or something. You know, it's not a ton of snaps. Uh, and again, it's it's just for one guy. Like, I, I, I'm really curious to see how they work Brookins and Anderson onto the field this year. And it might be, end up being one of those things where, like, we talk a lot about these guys in spring camp, but they don't end up really making an impact. That could end up, that could happen. But I don't know. The reviews are really, really positive on Brookins and Anderson right now. I mean, so much so that I'm talking about them here is like among the top like four storylines of spring camp so far. Uh, they've just gotten that much positive pub. They've made that many plays um, just kind of all over the place. And and it's, it's pretty exciting to see young players like that developing and stepping, you know, putting themselves in position to, to have a primary role. We'll just see how it kind of works out because there is some experience depth at quarter uh, at safety <laughs> during this season. Uh, for a second, my mind wandered back to the quarterbacks, and so I, I slipped there. All right, and then the last one is just sort of expanding on that topic. The last storyline we'll talk about here is sort of expanding on that topic out to the rest of the defense where there, there's a youth movement afoot. And I, I talked about this a lot last week. I wrote about it last week in a couple different places, and, and it's something that really still stands out to me is – you know, that Lovelace and Anderson aren't the only, or <laughs> wow, gave it away right there. Brookins and Anderson aren't the only young defenders who are making an impact this spring and look like they're going to be on the two deep and potentially in the starting lineup. Braylon Lovelace is another one. Um, Kyle Lewis is another one. Came out of the 2022 recruiting class. Sean Fitzsimmons from the 2022 recruiting class is another one. The other linebackers who signed last year with Lovelace, Rasheem Biles and Jordan Bass are all, I mean, all these guys are in position to make an impact. Rylan Gandy in the 2022 class at cornerback. You've got all these relatively young players, uh, either second or third year players, who, you know, with, with some opportunities opening up, are now positioned to make a big impact. There's young defensive tackles on this team. There are young linebackers on this team. And there are young safeties on this team. Right up the middle, you've got a lot of, recruits from the last two recruiting classes prior to the ones who were rolling this year as freshmen and and they're really in the mix for if not starting jobs rotational jobs and and prominent playing time and a lot of snaps and an opportunity to really make an impact and uh it, it's it's pretty remarkable to see um Every now and then you'll have these years where you have some roster turnover, you lose some veteran guys, some veteran guys graduate, move on, and and you end up with a bunch of young players stepping into new roles or more prominent roles. And that's happening here with Pitt. But it's, it's happening with, I think, some really talented guys. 
Like it's not just by default. I think Brookins and Anderson are going to be really good. I think Lovelace, Biles, and Bass are going to be really good. I think Fitzsimmons and Isaiah Neal are going to be really good. Kyle Lewis, I, you know, I think they're again, Ryland Gandy. I think there are some really good young defensive players on this roster, and they're all going to be prominently featured this season. Uh, and I and I think it's going to I think it's going to be exciting for the future because those guys are going to be they're going to be playing and they're going to be playing a lot and they're going to be leading this defense in 2024 and beyond. And I think that's been one of the prominent, one of the, I'm going to stop saying prominent now. I think that's been one of the main storylines this spring. And one of the most notable storylines this spring is that youth movement on defense and how it's really emerging, you know, and I think the coaches are even uh, impressed, uh, maybe even surprised by how much these young guys are, sort of positioning themselves to make a big impact this year. So I, I think that's I think that's a big storyline, and uh, it's going to be something we watch over the rest of spring camp and uh, heading into the season and probably during the season as well. All right, they'll have a spring practice tomorrow morning. We'll have uh, all the coverage from Pitt spring camp from practice number 10 right there at pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. We'll have lots of video content at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com as well. So make sure you check out the website and make sure you like this video and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I appreciate it. Hope you had a great weekend. I'm sure you did. And uh, hope your Monday goes well. Get through it and we'll be on to uh, day two of the week before you know it. So enjoy your Monday. Thanks for watching the video. And we will catch up with you tomorrow for the Morning Pit right here on youtube.com slash